Welcome to our ExxonMobil Oil Spill Response Knowledge Transfer webinar. Uh, I believe this is webinar 17. And uh, from today to the end of the year, uh, we are going to host a series on oil in the C4. And today we have uh, uh, our guest, Dr. Kersey Tika, who is the chair of the committee on oil in the C4. And she is going to give us an overview of oil in the C4. Uh, before I turn the floor to Dr. Tika, Tika, um, I'm going to go through some nuts and bolts uh, in case uh, uh, some of the attendees are, are like first timers. Uh, so our webinar is a uh, host uh, every first Tuesday of the month uh, from 10 to 11.15 uh, US Houston time. Uh, occasionally, we are moving the date uh, from uh, to the other week uh, due to holidays or major events, um, but I will send out a meeting invite, uh, invite in advance. Uh, so the format of the webinar is that uh, we'll give the speakers uh, uh, 45 to one hour minutes to talk, and then we'll leave uh, uh, around 15 minutes for questions. And the questions that can only be typed in through Q&A button will go through all the questions at the end, uh, at the end of uh, the talk. Uh, and most of the time we'll answer all the questions uh, alive. And for your information, we are going to record the whole webinar session, uh, both audio and the video. And, uh, uh, if you don't want to show your name, is that your in the recording? You can send out the questions anonymously. Uh, I also include a link uh, to those recordings in the meeting invite. Uh, most of our past webinars, uh, the recordings, of our uh, past webinars are in that uh, uh, website. Uh, but we, we will keep uploading uh, the recordings. Uh, so uh, that's all I need to say. Uh, I will turn the floor to Dr. Kika. Thank you, Lynn, and good day to all. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of oil in the C4 inputs, fates, and effects. Um, we will, as, as um, Lynn mentioned, there will be a a series of presentations that will go deeper into the different areas um, of the of the study. Uh, but before I talk about the the study and the report, um, I was asked to introduce myself um, and you know why why I am chairing this committee or or was chairing. So my name is Kirsi. Um, I I'm currently. An independent maritime advisor, and I'm on on, on boards of um, a few maritime companies, shipping companies, engineering companies, and I'm at the at the moment I'm based in London in the UK. Um, I have um, worked all my all my working life in uh, shipping and offshore. Um, my background is is technical, but I have been in many different roles. I worked. Um, for an oil company, shipping company. I work in a shipyard. Um, I have been a professor at Webb Institute, um, professor of naval architecture. And then my um, long, um, long uh, period uh, was with um, ABS, American Bureau of Shipping. Um, and I worked in different roles um, and uh, based both in the US and in Europe. Um, so the, my, uh, maybe the more uh, relevant to to the oil in the sea study, um, I have been from early on in my career involved in um, in um, double hull tanker studies dating back to the over ninety legislation, um, and um, and basically the um, my focus has always been on uh, maritime safety and environmental protection. And these days, um, it's there's a lot of focus on maritime decarbonization. So I'm involved in many, many um, projects in that area. Uh, from my um, educational background, I have a PhD in naval architecture and offshore engineering from uh, UC Berkeley, and master's degree in mechanical engineering from 
University of Technology in Helsinki. So I'm an engineer. I'm not a um, an oil spill scientist, but we had many of them on our committee, and we also had oil spill responders on on the committee. And some of them will be presenting in the follow up sessions. So moving on to the study overview. Um, in the fall of 2020, a committee of um, 17 members was convened uh, for consensus study um, titled Oil in the C4, um, Inputs, Fates and Effects. And it was sponsored by the organizations that are listed here on the slide. We held monthly meetings. Um, they were all virtual uh, because it was during the pandemic. So we actually never were able to have an in-person meeting, which was unfortunate. Um, but we, our meetings included several public meetings uh, where experts um, from federal and local governments, industry, indigenous committees, not-for-profit organizations and academia were invited to talk. Uh, the committee members also are reviewed a extensive amount of scientific literature and were supported by three consultant teams. And then finally, the report was peer reviewed by an additional 13 experts. To, prov to provide uh, a little bit of context for this study, um, this uh, study is the fourth, like the title says, the fourth in the series um, and um, that, the, that the National Academies has um, conducted to to discuss the state of knowledge um, on input rates and effects um, of oil in the sea, and then to recommend actions to reduce these inputs and effects. Um, the first report was published in 1975, and it has been now 20 years from that. And um, our latest report uh, was published last year, um, end of last year, and a lot, a lot of um, a lot has happened with, in those 20 years. Um, we have seen an unprecedented growth of oil spill science, and that is we tried to capture it all in our latest report. So uh, let's look at what is different about this update compared to the previous ones. Uh, first, um, whereas earlier National Academies reports mainly focused on quantifying hydrocarbon inputs in the sea. The current um, report has an extensive discussion of fates and effects, and it includes many advances in, 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 advance, in understanding of over the last 20 years. It highlights and synthesizes the extensive amount of post Deepwater Horizon research uh, following 10 years of dedicated funding for oil spill science. Uh, it includes details of complexity of oil mixtures to give um, a, a basis for the understanding and um, discussion in the other areas. And um, it also includes an oil chapter on oil spill response, which has not been covered in the previous report. And this, the committee decided to include it um, of course, because it's important to minimizing both the amount of oil spilled and also effects um, on environment and people. Um, this report also includes a, a, a discussion on human health and seafood safety, which has not been covered by the previous reports. Uh, the report has a detailed discussion and identification of gaps in understanding and suggestions for future research. And it provides overarching recommendations that uh, cross-cut multiple chapters. It is a very big report. It's um, almost 500 pages. It's, it's like a brick. Um, and to help the reader, reader um, we prepared a summary um, and each chapter includes conclusions at the end um, to help a reader um, to get a quick overview. It provides a comprehensive list of references 
and uh, textbook style explanations of the current definitions and state of knowledge of oil spill science, chemistry, fate, effects, and response, with a detailed table of contents to guide um, the reader. Um, it also updates the estimations of volume, volumes of oil entering the sea, and projections for future um, volumes as well. Finally, the report has recommendations for better estimating important inputs, decreasing inputs, decreasing effects, and preparing for future spill scenarios. The report is organized to show the journey of oil in the sea. Um, chapter two sets the stage by delving into the details of exactly what oil is, which is important for understanding the fate and effects, as well as selecting uh, response options. The journey then begins um, in chapter three with the origin of oil that ends up in the sea. Where is the oil coming from? What are the quantities? What can be done to prevent oil from entering the sea? Chapter four discusses spill mitigation measures through both source control and response in terms of what can be done to reduce the quantities and to minimize the negative effects. Chapter five continues the story of what happens to the oil once it reaches the sea, assimilating significant advancement in understanding of transport and fate um, of oil in the sea. And the journey ends with chapter six, um, which discusses the harm the oil can have on the marine environment over its journey. Um, finally, Due to the complex interdependencies among input space effects and the measures to reduce them, overall recommendations are not specifically tied to one topic or chapter, and they are presented in the final chapter of the report um, um, to summarize. So I will be discussing um, in my presentation um, each chapter, but um, I will only give a very um, high level summary of the topics discussed and uh, hopefully that will get you interested either in reviewing the report or and or um, uh, following the, the follow-up sessions that dive deeper into the, the topics. Starting with um, chapter two, um, it sets the stage for the rest of the report. Uh, by providing an overview of oil as a complex mixture of thousands of chemicals. Um, different chemical compositions translate to differences in each oil's fate and effects, and the chemical composition differences also distinguish one oil from another, which is used in the forensics of sources of inputs of spills. The knowledge of the chemical structure is also important um, in formulating detection, response, mitigation, and cleanup plans. The chapter uh, walks the, three, the reader through definitions and classifications, chemical compositions, sampling and analysis, in situ measurements and chemical analysis, uh, thermodynamics of oil mixtures, uh, phases and states of oil in the sea. And it draws conclusions and recommendations on analytical chemistry methodology, reporting of chemical composition, utilization of large databases, modeling, and new fuels. As illustrated in figure, in this figure, chapter three discusses inputs and provides estimates as, as much as possible from um, natural oil and gas seeps, land-based runoff, and atmospheric deposition, uh, operational discharges from um, extraction of hydrocarbons, marine transportation, recreational vessels, and aircraft fuel jettison. 
um, accidental spills from extraction of hydrocarbons, aging infrastructure and decommissioning, marine transportation by ships and pipelines, coastal storage facilities, and sunken wrecks. The objective of this chapter is to provide an update of estimates from the previous oil in the sea reports. Therefore, um, the inputs um, esti were estimated using the same basis as the previous um, report in, from 2003. As much as practical, um, to provide a comparison of the, the relative um, input volumes and, and to identify trends um, since that report. The previous, the 2003 report um, covered uh, accidental spill statistics uh, over a 10 year period from uh, 1990 to 1999. And this report covers the period of 10 years from 2010 to 2019. And um, if you read the report, uh, you'll find the, the data is reported in metric tons for consistency. Although we found the data lacking in, in many areas for accurately estimating many inputs of oil in, uh, into North American waters, the committee concluded um, that enough data do exist to at least understand the trends and in many cases to provide more precise estimations of annual volumes. The findings were summarized um, to directly compare with oil in the C3. Um, the volumes that are shown on this slide um, are annualized figures, not the totals for the periods um, shown. Um, these data uh, well, let me, let me just talk about a little bit um, of these um, different um, categories. So estimates for inputs from natural seeps is um, about one third lower now than it was in the 1990s. But this is due to changes in estimation methodology, mainly advancements in uh, remote sensing and hand casting methods. It must be also noted that the data are driven uh, by updates um, in Gulf of Mexico region because we had no data from other areas of North American waters. Extraction includes both as the operational discharges and accidental spills. Excluding deep water horizon, um, spills from 2010 to 2019 have been minor and of similar scale uh, to the 1990s. However, more spills took place in deeper waters in this period. The overall extraction uh, inputs uh, without, uh, without factoring the deep water horizon volume are three times higher in the 2010s than in the 1990s. And this is mainly due to increased produced water inputs corresponding to increased hydrocarbon uh, production. Um, ha we have to note, though, that uh, the, the volumes were estimated um, using the highest allowable um, uh, consistency of hydrocarbons in the produced water. So this is probably an, um, an upper limit. Um, if we look at extraction, including deep water horizon, the, um, of the, the amount is, is much higher. Inputs uh, from transportation of oil are much slower now than they were in the 1990s, um, over 10 times slower. Um, this includes spills uh, from pipelines, tank vessels, commercial vessels, coastal terminals, and coastal refineries, as well as operational discharges. Um, across the board, uh, the, the uh, estimates um, decreased, but the most uh, notable decrease was in tank vessel spills. The double hull tank requirement and other regulatory um, and oversight action by government agencies have been a significant uh, factor in reducing these inputs. Consumption is well 10 times higher than the 1990s. And this is um, reflective of population and uh, vehicle usage growth. 
Um, again, we need to know that data does not exist to estimate land-based runoff at any um, certainty. Um, however, for comparison, we use the same approach as oil in the C3. Um, the best estimate of land-based petroleum hydrocarbon to the sea came to be 1.2 million tons per year for North America and 4 million tons per year globally. Um, again, this, the estimate should be considered an upper limit as reductions um, due to individual choices and behaviors could reduce the inputs of oil um, from um, runoff, especially if they are in incentivized. And this is not factored into the calculation. Let's look at the totals. Um, the estimates of inputs from consumption, which is mainly runoff, and the deep water horizon spill overshadow all other inputs. Excluding these, um, the totals are close to the previous estimates. The consumption estimates have a high level of uncertainty and the deep water horizon event um, is a statistical outlier. Neither input can be ignored, but they highlight the significance of accurate data and the impact of low frequency, high volume events. The report does include um, recommendations for better qualifying SIPs, qu I'm not qualifying, quantifying SIPs, land-based sources, atmospheric deposition, produced water and discharge compliance from marine vessels. The report, um, the committee, in the report, the committee also um, identified uh, future challenges, and this includes um, aging offshore infrastructure risks from pipelines, platforms, sunken wrecks, uh, damage to offshore and coastal infrastructure caused by increases in extreme weather and sea level rise, more challenging and remote drilling environments um, such as deep waters, and Arctic conditions and changes in shipping routes. Also new fuels with unknown fate and effects um, can be a challenge and additional sources of oil hydrocarbons, for example, plastics. As I mentioned earlier, the committee chose to include um, chapter four accidental spill mitigator, mitigation as these measures can reduce uh, both inputs and effects of oil by first by control of the source of the spill, uh, be it from a well or a vessel, uh, to reduce the volume of oil that may enter the environment, and then the second by the response to the oil that has already entered the environment. Um, this chapter provides an extensive overview of source control and response options and identifies areas where more research is needed to increase effectiveness and efficiency of response plans in varying environmental conditions. The committee highlighted that while some experiments could be done in laboratory or with oil surrogates, the field experiments uh, with real oil would be more effective in testing and optimizing response techniques under realistic conditions. It also will be important to evaluate the effectiveness of existing response options on the new fuel types and modify them as, as needed. Many research projects only look at a very small component of oil, fate, behavior, impacts or response options. These um, individual results acquired for different environments, oils and scenarios, don't lend themselves to a seamless integration to understand how different response scenarios may affect the changes in oil fate or impacts. An integrated analysis is needed for all possible response scenarios to help selecting the ones um, resulting the best overall outcomes. 
Also, similarly to firefighters, oil spill responders are trained professionals using appropriate strategies and personal protective equipment. Yet, um, their exposure to oil and risks of response operations may affect their physical and mental health. These impacts need to be better understood and reduced to the extent possible. Uh, committee also identified opportunities for further improvements for all oil spill response techniques so that they could be more effective under various scenarios and environmental condi conditions. And long-term impacts on organis organisms should be evaluated and integrated into wildlife management strategies. Chapter five of uh, the report details the current state of science in terms of understanding fates of oil in the marine environment. Um, this chapter covers uh, fundamental transport and weathering processes as um, illustrated in, in the slide. And then discusses oil fates in specific marine environments uh, for both chronic and episodic inputs, modeling the transport and fate of the spilled of the spilled oil. The chapter discusses what we've learned in the past 20 years, what is now known, and identifies the most important gaps that remain uh, to be filled so that the models can better predict the fate of oil and, and better inform response operations. As illustrated on the slide, oil can be present uh, throughout the marine water column, on the seafloor, and at the surface. Uh, because oil is normally lighter than seawater and does not mix with water, it will float on the, on the sea surface, form bubbles or droplets in the ocean water column, and may sink uh, to the bottom in uh, association with um, heavier particles. Within each of these compartments, many other fate processes may occur, including dissolution, evaporation, photooxidation, and many biologically mediated processes. While we have made major progress on some important topics, um, further research is needed on by field scale behavior of oil droplets and droplet formation, photochemical reactions affecting the fates of oil and the effect of dispersion addition on these reactions, and biological modifications and degrade, degradation of oil, including understanding the kinetics and range of um, anaerobic biodegradation of oil in the sea. Uh, recent work suggests that anaerobic biodegradation of oil or degradation in low oxygen environments, such as the sediments, is significant, and the mechanisms and rates associated with these are much less studied than for aerobic biodegradation of oil. New processed um, oils are also coming to the market. And some of these may have um, unique and unknown fate processes and interactions with uh, seawater. Um, these oils include low sulfur fuel oils for maritime transport and diluted bitumen, so called dilbits. Um, there also remains the challenge of distilling this new process knowledge uh, into workable algorithms to predict oil behavior and fate. Um, and including new databases of oil properties. Chapter six describes effects of oil in the marine environment. Um, the committee organized um, discussion of effects based on uh, modes of exposure, physical contact, ingestion, inhalation, and absorption. The image here provides a simplification of relative effects of a generic oil discharge on the marine life according to mechanism of exposure. 
After describing modes of exposure and mechanisms of toxicity, the chapter discusses effects on populations, communities, and ecosystems, effects specific to the Arctic, effects on hum humans, and oil effects modeling. It also discusses limitations and challenges in interpreting laboratory toxicity data. Like the other chapters, um, chapter six ends with several findings and conclusions, as well as a table of research um, needed to better understand, um, predict, and minimize the effects of oil on the marine environment. Continued efforts, focused research is needed to further our understanding in several areas such as the need to develop techniques for real-time in-situ assessment, to conduct studies to fully understand the impacts of new oil types and the effects of oil in new or unstudied habitats, such as Arctic and deep sea. Further efforts are needed to understand understudied exposure routes, such as inhalation at the ERC interface, mechanisms of action resulting from low-level chronic exposures, including behavioral and food web implications. Despite a much improved understanding of the role of several envi environmental modifiers and co-stressors, Further research is needed moving forward with the framework of a changing environment. Although there have been significant advances in understanding and improvements in predict predictive toxicity models, further refinements and guidelines, um, for example, in toxicity testing is required. There also needs to be improvements made to current seafood safety guidelines, and expanded efforts for human health and community resilience uh, following the spill. Um, as sources, fates, effects, and response are tightly interconnected, the committee pulled out high-level needs that if addressed would improve understanding um, of uh, fates and effects of oil in the sea, and thus inform response measures that can minimize the effects of oil on the marine environment. We gave these overarching needs the broad term common themes to advance oil spill. Uh, these uh, themes include long-term funding, human health, open water experimentation, oil in the Arctic, new fuels, baseline knowledge and data, big data and interdisciplinary research. Given that this is um, one of the important deliverables from the report, I will um, discuss each one of these in more detail. The Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, uh, GOMRI, um, a 10-year program initiated after Deepwater Horizon oil spill resulted in an extraordinary output of both discipline-specific and multidisciplinary research by funding a mix of field, laboratory, mesocosm, and test facility science and related modeling. Advancement of oil spill science has a history of a boom and bust funding cycle and Consequently, the inability to sustain research and the scientific expertise to conduct the research. Therefore, the report includes a recommendation um, which um, is similar to one in Oil in the C3, that there remains a need for long-term sustained funding focused on oil in the sea to support multidisciplinary research projects that address current knowledge gaps, including those listed as research needs throughout this report. 
Research is needed to address new regulatory requirements and to improve response capabilities. The application of new data and technologies to advance interdisciplinary knowledge of, of fates and effects of oil in the sea will require a longer funding commitment than what is currently typical. The human aspects um, of oil in the sea permeates each of the decisions made up in cleanup activities. And to that end, it is paramount to understand how oil as well oil spills and their responses may affect human health and welfare. The inclusion of community-based human health assessment and mitigation measures into the incident command system response structure is needed to provide a more holistic approach regarding both human and ecosystem health. The recommendation is that the governmental agencies involved in responding to an oil spill should upgrade the priority and attention given to individual and community mental and behavioral effects and community socioeconomic disruptions in the incident command system, decision-making and response procedures. With um, regards to human health, uh, we have identified behavioral effects of oil releases, toxicity studies and models, seafood safety, coastal community response after an incident, follow-up of epi epidemiological studies, and maternal and child health histories. It is not possible to simulate all the complexities and variability of field conditions in a small scale or large scale uh, laboratory setting alone. Therefore, um, as recommended in previous reports, Controlled in situ field trials using real oils should be planned, permitted, and funded to incorporate multidisciplinary research focused on important processes as well as response techniques that do not accurately scale up from in vitro or ex situ experiments to in situ conditions. Additionally, funding and systematic mechanisms should be set in place by appropriate agencies to enable rapid deployment of qualified scientific personnel during actual oil spill event to conduct appropriate time critical research in situ outside the natural resource damage assessment process while having a minimal or no interference with our spill response activities. Marine traffic in the Arctic uh, waters is increasing uh, with a seasonal decrease in ice cover. And increased um, offshore oil production is a possibility in the future. Both of these factors uh, could lead to a higher risk of oil pollution in the Arctic. Yet um, oil spill science in um, Arctic waters and shorelines has lagged study of more temperate and, and more accessible marine ecosystems. Field experiments have uncovered many complex processes affecting oil in these environments. However, utilizing this information in modeling or response requires additional work. And in agreement with previous reports, there should be a concerted effort to gather information about the fate and effects of oil in the Arctic marine ecosystems with and without ice cover in advance of further development in this, of this region. This would include baseline surveys, efficacy of response and mitigation options, data acquisition on natural attenuation and active remediation st strategies, including biodegradation kinetics at low temperature and effects of higher organisms, populations and ecosystems in Arctic waters and on shorelines. Um, new requirements for low sulfur fuel oils for marine shipping came into effect in 2020s, 
but studies on these new types of um, oils um, are extremely limited. There are only um, very few um, studies on very low sulfur fuel and ultra low sulfur fuel oil. Um, and um, the samples studied to date differ chemically from traditional marine fuel oils and from each other. Um, there's insufficient research um, that's been conducted to determine um, transport and weathering behavior, biodegradability and toxicity, and different um, formulations under these um, diverse environmental conditions. Government should fund research needed to study the composition, toxicity, and behavior of new types of marine fuels. For example, low sulfur fuel oil, ultra low, ultra low sulfur fuel oil, and, and biofuels. And petroleum products such as a diluted bitumen, so that the fate and effects um, of these products can be understood and um, response operations can be planned and executed most effectively to reduce impacts. After a spill has occurred, um, assessment and research efforts often do not have appropriate or requisite um, pre-spill data for comparison with uh, post-spill observations and assessment of our remediation. This limits the ability to assess the inputs, rates, and effects. And of course, um, we can't just measure everything all the time. And therefore, the committee recommends a review of how pertinent knowledge and data from numerous sources are most effectively assembled, made available, and achieved, given the advances and gaps in understanding noted in this report. A review should be assessed, should assess what is needed uh, for baseline knowledge. And, they, and um, with the understanding that both natural and anthropogenic influences result in, in baselines that are dynamic in space and time. Funding should be established for appropriate baseline data acquisition and curation in our locations of particular interest such as coastal areas areas with offshore energy exploration and production, and marine transportation routes. And as a corollary, guidelines should be developed for collecting and analyzing baseline data immediately after and during a spill from our neighboring unaffected uh, control areas where possible. And finally, interdisciplinary research. Um, enormous um, streams of data have been uh, generated from advances in analytical techniques, particularly in petroleum and environmental chemistry and in omics. Archival and maintenance of this big data to make it universally accessible is essential for meaningful interpretation of the data and to support interdisciplinary research linking oil chemistry to the fates and effects in the environment to inform our response. A free, central, universally accessible and curated repository should be formed for information pertinent to oil in the sea in order to better manage the enormous data sets being generated through advanced chemical analysis, omics techniques, geoscience surveys, among others, and especially field and laboratory studies um, to oil spills. Optimum use of such archives will require development of data analytics, data quality control, and reporting standards for associated metadata to enable integration and interpretation uh, by and training of interdisciplinary teams. To summarize, um, 
some of the key take takeaways from these studies are um, available data are inadequate for accurate quantification of most inputs. Although sufficient data was available to identify trends. Estimates of land-based inputs by far outweigh all other sources. Again, the level of such uncertainty of these inputs is very high. Future sources of oil in the sea may look different due to, for example, intense weather, sea level rise, aging infrastructure, new shipping routes, and new fuels. The broad oil spill community should be prepared for these new challenges. Unprecedented progress has been made in understanding oil spill science in the last two decades. Um, to continue growing the knowledge, sustained funding is needed um, so that we can progress and adapt to changing parameters in the world. Human health effects of oil includes adverse individual and community harm. Many research gaps remain in understanding fates and effects of oil in the sea that if filled uh, could inform more effective and efficient response in a changing environment, changing baseline and coast stressors. That uh, concludes my overview of the oil in the C4 um, input states and effects. And I would be available for questions or comments or uh, listen to your, your discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tika. That's great overview uh, of the, uh, the the new series. And uh, yeah, oil in the sea is always a great source of information and knowledge for me. And uh, and I think addition of uh, response and uh, you know other chapters are like really really great. Uh, you know for uh, oil spill responders and researchers. Um, so I believe like many of the chapters, even by itself, can form, probably can form a book. And I just wondering, uh, um, how do you decide what depths of knowledge you put in, in this book for <laughs> the different chapters? I, I, I guess it's difficult to choose, like, you know, uh, all the studies, right? Well, well, basically, the the way um, we structured the report was really the the journey of the oil from inputs to the effects, and uh, we um, the committee basically tried to cover all the information that has been developed since the previous report, and that's why if you look at the reference list in the book, it's very extensive, over three thousand references, because it does really cover. Um, a lot of lot of information. Um, so we really did not disregard um, any um, research that was available to us. We although we did uh, scope out certain things that were not part of the the task statement directly, and that were covered um, by other studies um, by national academies, such as plastics, for example. Even though plastics are hydrocarbon products. Uh, we decided not to um, we discuss it in our report because there was a, a separate study, uh, National Academy study on, on that subject. The same thing on, um, uh, there were some other areas that included, um, in, that were studied in other reports that we, we did exclude for that reason. But otherwise, it's, it's a very comprehensive report. Um, I'd be very surprised if any of you would read the entire report from uh, front to back, but certainly um, you can um, you can review the um, the summaries as well as um, read those chapters that are most of most interest to you and, and your work um, life. Yeah, great, great. Thank you. And we have uh, one question. Great presentation. Thank you for new fields. That's the text. 
uh, provide the justification of why specific new fields should be targeted for future research. For example, numbers showing increase the transport of those specific uh, fuels. Um, so there are different aspects to the new fuel. So one aspect is the uh, concern about um, oil spills of the new low sulfur fuels. Um, because all um, ships um, in worldwide trade are required to burn low sulfur fuels unless they have a sulfur scrubber on board. And so um, basically the majority of ships um, carry low sulfur fuel oil. And if they do have accidents on the spill, um, accidents that would involve fuel spills, um, that would be low sulfur fuel. And because of the differences of compositions um, of these different fuels, um, uh, it's a concern that the response um, activity might not be the right activity since we don't we're not familiar with the fuels. So that's not so much, we don't have numbers, but it is basically the majority of the worldwide shipping um, carrying these fuels. Um, in terms of transportation of um, specific fuels, uh, no, we don't, we don't have numbers. Uh, we just know that there's an increased amount of transportation of these fuels, um, but we do not have um, specific numbers, for example, for deal bits, um, or, or transportation of not low sulfur fuels. But, but the transportation was a lesser concern for us than the fact that the fuel oil spills would involve these new types of fuels. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yeah, welcome to submit any questions uh, uh, from the audience. And uh, so I have a question about um, uh, the volume, the input so you have, uh, 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 kind of a, a table to show the uh, the volume, right? And so those are kind of, especially for those with the uh, uh, response measures, so those are like the volume input without a consider consideration of response measures, right? Uh, the total volume. Um, yeah. You, you're referring to this. Um... Yeah, yeah, this one. So these are these are actually statistics, um, actual statistics. So um, this would be um, because it does not sep separate spills. This table does not separate spills or um, uh, operational discharges. This doesn't really um, show those numbers separately. But but for um, spills, for example, um, we had. Um, statistics on spill volumes. And this data was actually not so easy to come by, but mm -hmm. it's with the, the certainty of that, um, uh, or the confidence level of those numbers is higher than most other um, data that we have for inputs. But that those estimates would then already, um, the, it would be the, the total volume spilled or the estimated total volume of spilled not if there was a, a removal of some um, amounts that would not be included. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. And it seems the consumption over the last 20 years has increased a lot. Is because the population increased so? Yeah. So, so the, the methodology used in um, in estimating these numbers is based on how much population on the population growth and use of cars um, and and like like I mentioned it's very there's very low confidence level for these numbers because it does first for example it does not include other increase of electric cars it does not um, take into account that people may um, have different behavior patterns than uh, than um, than twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so it's purely based on the population growth and the and the increased use of cars. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, um, it seems uh, we don't have uh, further questions uh, from the audience. 
and uh, yeah. And if no questions, then uh, we'll we'll finish today's uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Tika. It's not easy to, you know, do a presentation, take a lot of effort. We really appreciate that you uh, give us the talk today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, you know, everybody stay on and uh, uh, we're finished today's uh, webinar. We'll see you next uh, for next round. I think the next round will be the input uh, chapter for the audio in the C4. And I think it's going to be John Farrington, who mm -hmm. I'm sure many of you know well. There's some, I, I see there's, a, oh, there's just a comments. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, there are more comments here. Uh, oh, it's all like, um, uh, thank you, great work. And uh, yeah, yeah, thank you so